All right. Uh, I'm in a particularly fortunate situation. I uh, said that I would talk about our call, submitted, a, uh, submitted an abstract, and then uh, Simon Byrne and Randy Lyde did most of the work. <laughs> so I get to stand up here, I get the jacket, and they did the work. Uh, <laughs> so the motivation for our call is the same as the motivation for C call, for Pi call, for Java call, et cetera, in that um, it allows you to use capabilities from other languages. Julia is a relatively new language. You don't have the opportunity to rewrite those 30 years worth of uh, packages that have been developed for, uh, for R, for Python, and so forth. And <clears throat> for those coming to Julia, it makes for an easier transition. Uh, now, the specific reasons for our call, one of the things that I started off doing it for was because I, I knew a lot of the data sets that were available in R, and I wanted to have easy access to them in Julia. Um, and there were a few things. Uh, there's the uh, R data sets package and so forth. Um, in the end, I decided that the way that R stores data, R parses that very well. So I might as well then grab the things out of R. Also, many people know how to use graphics packages like ggplot2 or Lattice, and you know it takes a lot to redevelop that kind of um, that kind of. Talk to me. Um, okay. Oh, here we are. <coughs> that kind of uh, capability. Um, to get to the chase, to cut to the chase, I'll spell Julia correctly. This is just bringing up the Julia REPL. Um, <coughs> so if I want to uh, bring in our call, uh, I'll show you in a moment that the version is <laughs> the version du jour almost. Uh, it was from Monday, I think, um, the version of our call. Um, so suppose that I generate a uh, uh, function to get a Brownian motion, um, set, a, set the random number generator. And so I have um, number uh, 10,000 instances for 10,000 10, steps in a Brownian motion process. And here's where things get interesting. You know, this morning, Kino was talking about there's several different modes for the REPL. And in fact, it's extensible. And this is what Randy was doing over the weekend. Um, various keys trigger the switches. And we use dollar because it has a peculiar uh, characteristic within, <laughs> within the uh, R language. So you've now switched into an R REPL. And at this point, you can say things like, uh, OK, I want to have the ggplot2 library. And give me this um, ggplot of this thing that um, the Brownian motion that I defined in Julia. Uh, so then AES x equals x, y equals y, plus uh, geon underscore line. And you get your ggplot2 plot coming up for you. Uh, so that's kind of fun that you can do the generation in, in Julia and then see the, uh, see the visualization and so on inside of, um, inside of R. Um, when you decide to switch back, it's a, a backspace here and now you're back to Julia again. So that's, uh, that's the, that's Randy's weekend. Uh, 
The low-level interface, so the high-level interface, which you just saw, is the R REPL mode. There's also an R string <coughs> macro. Um, intermediate level, there's a couple of macros that are called R put and R get to transfer things back and forth. And finally, the low-level interface, there's things called R call, which is going to call an R function, R eval, which will parse an eval, and R copy. So I remember I said there's all those data sets. And so something like just saying R copy of the data sets colon colon iris. This is an R notation saying go within that package and get this particular object within that package um, in that package's environment. Uh, so suddenly it appears. Unfortunately, uh, as many of us have encountered R has this uh, idea that the dot or the period is part of the syntax. It, is, it can be part of an identifier. It doesn't have sig uh, syntactic uh, significance except when it does. And so, you know, it's, it's really a mess. Uh, okay, uh, this is just calling, you know, find out what's currently on the search path in the R instance. Here's my Brownian function again. If I wanted to do it by transferring that data frame over to R, I could uh, then go ahead. This is the uh, R string macro. So you may know that if you put uh, an identifier in front of a quoted string, it looks for a macro with that identifier name underscore str. So this allows you to say, OK, evaluate this within R. All right. And again, it's bringing in the library and doing that. So here, there's no dollar sign because I've transferred this object, which was called BR and Julia, to the same name within R. That's what the R put does. Uh, you can also allow interpolation within this R string macro. Um, I end up at many times that <laughs> I've written code and for too many languages to fit a particular kind of statistical model. So I want to know, OK, am I getting the results? Are the results consistent between them? So here, this is going through doing the visualization. These happen to be um, reaction times measured on people after uh, several days of sleep deprivation. Um, and uh, initially, I thought that these were soldiers because it was done at Walter Reed. Uh, it turns out that they're long-distance driver, truck drivers, <laughs> which may be even more frightening than soldiers. I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, I, there's, a, there's a similar method of uh, setting up the call to fit the model here. And this is the Julia method, which I can go back and forth with. I can also then start extracting and comparing, OK, how, how well was the objective, which is called a deviance in this case, uh, how well did Julia do compared to what R did on this, what's the parameter over which I'm optimizing, and so forth. Uh, the implementation, we're not going to talk about. <laughs> You're going to have to read the code. Uh, I did want to mention, yeah, so. Here's the, um, here's the uh, repository. One of the things to notice here is it's all written in Julia, <laughs> which is quite remarkable to me, having done this, thing, this sort of thing in other languages, to be able to do that all within the uh, dynamic language. Thank you. <laughs>